Music Revolutionaries. You're probably wondering what I've got in this briefcase. Is it my lunch? Some documents marked, most secret for your eyes only. No, it's a synthesizer. The EMS Synth A, the coolest synthesizer of the analog era. Maybe because the 60s were also the period of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, this synthesizer seems perfectly suited to a James Bond movie. One with Sean Connery in it, of course. It's an unfortunate truth of history that technological advances are often made as a result of war. That's true of the technology we now use for making music today. At the end of World War II, one man saw the potential of this new technology and seized the opportunity, British electronic music pioneer Tristram Carey. Tristram had been a radar operator in the British Navy during the war, at a time when radar was still highly secret and he had an insider's view of a technological revolution that was about to begin. At the end of the war, with the demobilization of huge German and allied armies, a flood of superfluous technology, radios, electronic parts, recording devices, came onto the market and could be bought relatively cheaply. So Tristram bought some of them and constructed a home studio from scratch. He then began experimenting with it to create music. He'd always had a great love of music, and he determined to make it his career by combining it with his interest in science and technology. He still continued, however, to write conventional music for orchestra, especially for films, and created some classic soundtracks for Ealing comedies, Hammer horror films, and for Disney studios. But opportunities for electronic soundtracks were mainly in radio. Tristram created the first all-electronic soundtrack for the BBC in 1955, for a radio play called The Japanese Fisherman about atomic bomb tests in the Pacific. A couple of years later, the BBC formalized its experiments with electronic soundtracks by creating one of the most important places in the history of electronic music, the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. It's interesting and important to note that two of the pioneers at the Radiophonic Workshop were women, Daphne Oram and Delia Derbyshire. It's important because we sometimes get the impression that technology is primarily the domain of men. And it is true that barriers were often put up for women in this field. Delia Derbyshire was told by Decca Records that they did not employ women in their studios. Fortunately, the BBC was more open-minded. Delia was a graduate in music and mathematics, and she applied her knowledge of both fields to working with sound. Her most famous contribution to the radiophonic workshop was her electronic arrangement of Ron Grainer's theme to Doctor Who. She transformed it so thoroughly that when he heard it, the composer asked her, did I write that? To which she replied, most of it. Now the careers of Tristram Carey and Delia Derbyshire became linked through Doctor Who when Tristram was engaged to write incidental music for the series. His work for the episodes of the Daleks Master Plan remained one of the high points of electronic music in the 1960s. One of the great achievements of Tristram Carey, Delia Derbyshire and the BBC Radiophonic Workshop was to place electronic music in the mainstream media. The millions of people who tuned in weekly to Doctor Who didn't question whether it was music or not. They took it for granted without thinking about the fact that what they were listening to was actually a musical revolution. At the time, elsewhere, Electronic music was largely confined to experimental studios, universities, and attracted small and specialised audiences. While in Britain, electronic music was being broadcast into homes across the nation every Saturday night. Not content with the tools available to him at the time, Tristram Carey got together in 1969 with two others, Peter Zanoviev and David Cockerell, to form the company EMS. Their aim was to produce affordable synthesizers that were relatively easy to use. The outcome was the EMS VCS-3 and its 1971 offshoot, the Synthy A, housed James Bond-like in a briefcase. These synthesizers were light and portable and more or less intuitive to use. An original patching system resembling the board for a game of Battleship made it easy to follow signal paths without the spaghetti-like tangle of cables. EMS synthesizers rapidly became popular, not only with classical composers, but with rock groups and pioneering electronic groups, including The Who, Roxy Music, Pink Floyd, Tangerine Dream, Giorgio Moroder, and Kraftwerk. 
In the early 1970s, Tristram Carey moved to Adelaide, where he directed the electronic music studio here at the Older Conservatorium of Music, which by then had become Australia's leading centre for electronic music. He brought with him synthesizers, including the ones you see here, and an immense knowledge about the processes and technologies of electronic music. His legacy is still with us today. Here you can see the classic EMS synthesizers, the VCS3 and the Synthe A. The patch matrix is located in the middle. Inputs are on the horizontal axis and outputs on the vertical axis. The signal can be sent from input to output and back to input multiple times if desired. Filters, reverb and envelope shaping are available, as are multiple inputs including keyboard. There are stereo speakers at the top of the synth, though of course the sound can also be sent to a PA or to some other device. All in all, it's a very simple arrangement, but hours of fun can be had playing around with different settings. Often even a small adjustment to a setting can have a significant and sometimes unexpected effect on the sound. <laughs>